The first hint of dawn paints the sky with a soft pink hue as I make my way through the dense forests of Yosemite. As a park ranger, I'm attuned to the rhythm of the woods, the gentle harmony of rustling leaves, birdsong, and the distant trickle of a hidden stream. Tall redwoods stand around me, their gnarled roots weaving over the forest floor. Squirrels dart across the path, their small bodies a blur of motion against the vibrant greenery. Somewhere overhead, a bird lets out a long, trilling melody, and the forest answers in kind. It's another beautiful day in Yosemite, tranquil and full of promise. As I continue my walk, I take in the symphony of sights and sounds, appreciating the serenity only nature can offer. I've traversed this route countless times. But today, my peaceful daze has disrupted my stumble upon a sight that sends a sense of unease through me. Just off the path, a large swath of underbrush has been trampled and destroyed. The greenery mashed into the earth, creating a path of destruction through the typically pristine environment. A closer inspection reveals something more troubling. Massive footprints, bigger than any I've ever seen, embedded deep into the soil. These footprints don't belong to any creature native to these woods. Not a bear and not a moose. The prints are too large. The shape of them is unlike anything I've ever encountered in my years as a park ranger, let alone in Yosemite's serene ecosystem. The footprints measure at least two feet long and nearly as wide, dwarfing any other track I've seen. It's an elongated oval shape that bears some vague resemblance to a bear's, but the size and certain distinct features quickly rule out that possibility. From the deepest part of the depression, a series of ridges extend outward like waves radiating from a pebble dropped in water. These ridges, I realize, are the impressions of claws, five of them, and they're brutally sharp, slicing into the ground with a strength that speaks of a massive creature. The claws themselves are arranged in an unusual pattern. The three in the middle are larger and more prominently etched into the earth, while the two on either side are smaller, almost as if they're thumbs. But that's impossible, isn't it? No animal I know of in these parts has such a configuration. Even more peculiar, there's a symmetry to these footprints, a kind of uniformity that sends a shiver down my spine. I stand up, dusting off my knees, the eerie sight of the footprints still in my mind. Something powerful and foreign had made its way through Yosemite, and the discovery of its existence brings a chill to the early morning air. I cast a wary glance around the forest, my senses now on high alert. The serene landscape suddenly appears more menacing, hiding secrets in its shadows. A cold sense of dread grips me. This isn't just a simple disturbance. This is evidence of something truly abnormal. Suddenly, the forest doesn't seem so tranquil. Instead, it feels like it's holding its breath. I know every inch of Yosemite like the back of my hand, every creature that calls it home. But this, this is something else, something entirely unknown. A couple of days later, as the first light of dawn breaks through the ancient canopy of Mariposa Grove, my usual sense of awe is replaced by a cold dread. Before me, one of the majestic sequoias, a centuries-old giant, lies toppled. It's a catastrophic sight. The fallen tree's thick trunk, usually a symbol of enduring strength, now bears massive gouges, mangled and torn apart. Each indentation is as wide as my hand and twice as deep. It's as if the tree has been shredded by claws, but these markings are far larger and sharper than those of any native creature I know of. The sheer force required to not just scar, but to completely uproot such a behemoth is beyond comprehension. I've encountered bears and even mountain lions in the park, but this, this is the work of a creature far more powerful and far more terrifying. I step back, my gaze sweeping over the disturbed soil and shattered bark, the scene of destruction sending a wave of unease through me, I can't shake the feeling of being watched. Whatever creature caused this devastation, its strength and brutality are beyond anything I've ever witnessed in Yosemite. The most chilling discovery comes one frigid midnight when I patrol near Glacier Point. As I tread the usual path, my flashlight catches on something unusual. A pool of liquid lies nestled in the snow. It glimmers, not with the cold radiance of ice or the clear sheen of water, but with a phosphorescent glow. The light it emits is soft and steady, painting the surrounding landscape with an ethereal glow. Cautiously, I approach. As I kneel to examine it, the glow intensifies, casting eerie shadows that dance and flicker on the snow. The substance is viscous, thicker than water, and its consistency is more similar to sap. 
but it's the warmth radiating from it that leaves me truly puzzled. The snow around it has melted into a clear ring, the liquid remaining warm in the biting cold. Tentatively, I reach out, my gloved fingers making contact with the glowing liquid. It's not just warm, it's almost hot. Nothing in Yosemite, nothing in my experience as a ranger, can explain this phenomenon. My mind races with questions. What is this substance? How did it end up here? And why is it glowing and radiating heat? One afternoon, while trekking through a meadow overflowing with wildflowers, a flock of starlings that are usually a joyful spectacle in the sky abruptly burst from the treetops, their flight patterns frantic and disorderly. On another day, as twilight descends upon the forest, I find a family of deer grazing near a glade. But instead of the usual calm and serenity, there's a tangible tension in their behavior. Their muscles remain taut, their ears flicking at the slightest rustle of leaves. Their usually soft, gentle eyes are wide and alert, reflecting a primal fear that I find deeply unsettling. Every snap of a twig, every whisper of the wind seems to startle them, their bodies ready to bolt at a moment's notice. Even the smaller creatures, the rabbits and squirrels that often frolic around without a care, appear apprehensive. I scurry quickly, sticking close to the underbrush. I've spent enough time in the wilderness to recognize this behavior. It's the fear of a predator, the fear of the threat that looms large in their small world. The park that was once a haven of peace and tranquility feels altered. The air is heavy with an uneasiness that trickles down from the towering sequoias to the tiny mushrooms nestled in the undergrowth. It's as if Yosemite has been gripped by a silent wave of fear, a primal instinct that has even the smallest critter on edge. Even stranger, there's been an unusual military presence around the park. Large, intimidating trucks drive down our narrow roads. Men and women in crisp uniforms, their stern faces closed off, acting in hushed urgency. One day, driven by curiosity and growing concern, I decide to approach one of the officers. She's a stern-looking woman with hawkish eyes and a face that commands respect. I introduce myself, trying to keep my voice steady. Officer, I'm Sam a ranger here at Yosemite. Her eyes scrutinize me for a moment before her lips curve into a tight-lipped smile, Ranger Sam. We've been informed about you. Her response piques my interest. Informed. I'm not sure if that's good or bad. She merely chuckles, a sound devoid of warmth. Just part of the protocol. Nothing personal. I swallow hard, deciding to dive into the heart of the matter. I've noticed there's been quite the increase in military activity around here. Is everything okay? Her smile remains plastered, a practiced facade as she nods. Just routine exercises, Ranger Sam. I raise my eyebrow at her response. Routine. There's nothing routine about this. I've spent over a decade in Yosemite, and the peace of the park has never been disrupted like this. Routine exercises. I question, skepticism evident in my voice. In all my years here, this is the first. She doesn't break eye contact, her gaze hardening slightly. There's a first time for everything. There's a finality in her tone, a silent message that the conversation is over. As I watch her retreat to the convoy of military trucks, my mind races with unanswered questions. Their presence, the creature, and the anomalies, everything seems interconnected, but I'm just not sure how. A few nights later, my patrol takes me deeper into the park than usual. The solitude of the night feels both comforting and ominous. The moon hangs high above, its light weaving through the branches and casting eerie shadows on the forest floor. As I venture further, a bone-chilling growl cuts through the stillness. The sound is deep, resonating through the forest. My heart stammers in my chest. It's a sound I've never heard before. A sound that doesn't belong here. Slowly, I turn toward the direction of the sound. My flashlight cuts through the darkness, revealing a pair of glowing eyes reflecting in the moonlight. The sight of the creature that emerges from the dense underbrush steals my breath away. It's a creature unlike anything I've ever seen. Towering over me, it stands on its hind legs, its massive body covered in thick, shaggy fur that glistens ominously under the moonlight. Its eyes, a startling shade of green, hold a predatory glint that sends a shiver coursing down my spine. Instinctively, I take a step back, my mind buzzing with disbelief and fear. My fingers grip the radio at my side, but my gut tells me this situation is beyond anything backup can handle. The creature's raw power and its predatory presence int at a deadly capability. And then it hits me, the connection between the military's sudden appearance and this creature. 
The two are intertwined, somehow linked. But the nature of their connection, the how and why, I'm not sure yet. The creature suddenly lunges, its roar echoing through the night. I'm propelled into action, sidestepping its attack just in time. Adrenaline surges through me as I break into a run. The heavy thud of the creature's pursuit a haunting echo in the darkness. I can't outrun it, I'd know that. So, in a desperate move, I spin around, flashlight brandished like a weapon. The light catches the creature square in its eyes, momentarily disorienting it. I seize the moment to retreat and disappear into the forest. As I head back to the ranger station, the enormity of the situation weighs heavy on my shoulders. That creature is out there, and it's a threat not just to me, but to the entire park. The military is here too, but they're more of a mystery than a help. What is their connection with the creature? Are they here to help, or are they part of the problem? The questions keep swirling in my head, but one thing is clear. I can't just stand by and do nothing. I sit at my desk, maps and photographs of the park spread out in front of me. I stare at them, trying to get a plan formed in my head. If I'm to deal with this creature, I need to understand it better and find its weakness. Then a thought strikes me. What if I could trap it? Use my extensive knowledge of Yosemite to my advantage. A plan begins to form. Trapping a creature of that size and strength will be no easy task. I need to outthink it and use the landscape as an ally. I look over the maps, focusing on the areas where I've encountered the creature or its signs. There's a pattern there, a territory it seems to frequent. I decide to concentrate on the area around El Capitan. It's a challenging terrain, the towering granite walls and narrow trails could work to my advantage, creating a natural bottleneck. I can gather the creature there and corner it. But how to lure it? I rack my brain, thinking about the creature and its behavior. It seems to be nocturnal and more active at night. I remember the uprooted tree, the flocks of disturbed birds, and the deer's fearful behavior. They were all reacting to a predator, a new apex predator. I'll need bait, something to lure the creature to El Capitan. But what? After some thought, I decide on using a mix of deer scent and a recording of deer distress calls. I start compiling a list of supplies I'll need, heavy-duty ropes, stakes to secure them, a hunting blind for camouflage, and a weapon. I don't want to harm the creature, but I need to protect myself. A tranquilizer gun seems the best option. It should incapacitate the creature without causing any permanent harm. The plan is set. It's risky and dangerous, but it's the only hope I have. I begin the preparations for my trap early the next morning. The air is crisp, the dewy scent of the forest fills my lungs, and despite the fear gnawing at my insides, there's a strange sense of peace. I grab my backpack, stocked with the essentials, a compass, a few energy bars, heavy-duty ropes, a hunting knife, and a map of Yosemite. The tranquilizer gun is the last thing I pick up. My first task is to scout El Capitan. With every step I take towards it, my plan feels less like a foolish scheme and more like a real strategy. The natural bottleneck provided by the towering walls and dense wood surrounding the vase is exactly what I need. Next, I gather large stakes, sturdy branches fallen from trees around the area, to secure my ropes. Their sharp ends will go into the ground, forming the backbone of my trap. It's hard work, and my palms are soon blistered from whittling and hammering, but I can't afford to care. After selecting the ideal area to set my trap, I focus on building the hunting blind. The spot I choose for this is nestled at the edge of the bottleneck, where the terrain slopes into a small rise. From here, I have a clear line of sight towards the trap, while also being slightly elevated. It's perfect. Building the blind, however, is a task requiring precision and patience. I start with a frame, utilizing fallen branches to construct the basic structure. The aim is to create a small enclosed area, just enough to conceal myself and my equipment. I tie the branches together with a sturdy cord, creating a low, dome-shaped outline that blends with the natural landscape of the forest floor. Next, I drape one of my camouflage tarps over the frame, ensuring the material falls naturally, like the hanging moss on the trees. The colors blend seamlessly with the surrounding foliage, making the blind nearly indistinguishable from the rest of the forest. For the interior, I scatter a layer of dry leaves on the floor, providing some form of insulation against the cold earth. There's just enough space for me to sit comfortably with my equipment beside me. I cut out a small window on one side, just enough for me to see out, but small enough to keep me concealed. 
A makeshift hood fashioned out of another tarp creates a cover, shielding me from any unexpected rain or drizzle. To further blend the blind into the environment, I gather more branches and leaves, layering them over the tarp. I even sprinkle some dirt on it, letting the earthy color mute the vibrant camouflage pattern. From a distance, it looks like just another mound of forest debris. But it's not just the view of the trap that makes this spot ideal. Its proximity to the river means the sound of rushing water will mask any noise I might make. Also, the undergrowth is denser here, which would make it harder for the creature to charge at me directly. The following days are filled with rigorous checks and rechecks of my preparations. I practice my aim with a tranquilizer gun, setting up makeshift targets around the park. The kickback is stronger than I expected, and my first few shots are way off. But with time, my aim improves. Over the course of the next few days, I dedicate myself to learning the patterns of the creature. I search the areas it frequents, studying the remains of its activity, and even venture closer to its territory under the cover of night. As dangerous as it feels, I need every piece of information I can get. One of the first things I notice is its routine. The creature is nocturnal, most active just after sunset and before sunrise. The signs of its presence are most evident then, broken branches, disturbed wildlife, that eerie silence that now seems synonymous with its existence. This knowledge helps me plan my schedule, maximize my rest during the day to keeping watch at night. In addition, I note that the creature is territorial. The destruction and signs of his presence are concentrated in certain areas, a pattern that suggests as claimed these parts of the park as its own. This is a critical piece of information. It not only helps me avoid unnecessary confrontations, but also guides me in where to set out the trap. I also discover that the creature is not random in its movements. It follows a certain path marked by the most significant signs of its presence. While it may seem random to the untrained eye, years of tracking animals in Yosemite allow me to recognize this detail. This path, this routine, it gives me an advantage. I know where it will be and that is half the battle won. I also pay close attention to the local wildlife. Their behaviors have been a reliable indicator of the creature's presence. When the birds cease their singing, when the deer disappear into the underbrush, I know the creature is near. I use these cues to keep myself safe and to avoid accidentally running into the creature during my investigations. What strikes me the most, though, is the fear the creature instills in the other animals. The park feels different. It's as if a thick shroud of fear has blanketed over Yosemite, smothering the natural harmony. The animals are living on a razor's edge. As the days pass, I realize that it's not just the physical preparation I need. I need to be mentally ready too. The fear is always there, lurking in the back of my mind. I learn to keep it at bay to focus on my mission. Now it's time to set up the trap. At its core, the trap is a gigantic net, but not just any net. This one is reinforced with steel cables and barbs. It should be enough to hold and incapacitate the creature, at least long enough for me to hit it with a tranquilizer. The net was part of an old project to relocate large animals when they wandered too close to populated areas. It was designed to be strong and durable, to hold against the thrashing of a bear of the powerful leap of a mountain lion. However, it had been gathering dust in one of our storage sheds for years. I found it pushed to the back behind crates of unused bear-proof bins and stacks of old park maps. Its substantial weight was an issue. Hitting it to my chosen trap location took considerable effort. I used a small ATV to transport it as close as possible, then had to drag it the rest of the way. The net, initially folded in a neat pile, is concealed beneath a covering of leaves and dirt right in the center of the clearing. A series of ropes are threaded through pulleys I've installed in the towering trees surrounding the clearing, and these ropes are connected to the net. It's a simple snare trap, just on a much larger scale. When the creature steps into the center of the clearing to investigate the bait, it'll trigger a tripwire hidden in the undergrowth. This will release the ropes holding the net, causing it to spring upwards, ensnaring the creature. With the help of the ATV, I've also placed several large logs above the net, suspended by more ropes. These logs would fall with the release of the net, adding weight to keep the creature grounded. I understand the strength of this creature, and I'm taking no chances. Despite its simplicity, setting up the trap is physically demanding. Every pulley needs to be secured high up in the trees, Every rope needs to be tensioned just right. The net itself is heavy and cumbersome, but I've managed to get it positioned it correctly, camouflaging it well. I test the tripwire multiple times, ensuring it will release the net when tripped. 
Once everything is ready, I stand back to survey my handiwork. To the untrained eye, it looks like just another part of the forest. But in reality, it's a carefully designed trap waiting to be sprung. I can only hope that it will work when the creature arrives. With the trap and blind completed, the time has finally come to set my plan into motion. The air hangs heavy with a mix of anticipation and anxiety, the forest seemingly holding its breath alongside me. I use the remaining daylight to make final preparations, knowing well that everything needs to be perfect. I've locked the perimeter one last time, checking the ropes and counterweights for the net trap. They're hidden under leaves and loose soil, and I make sure they're well camouflaged. I tighten the knots, ensuring they're secure, but will also release when the trap is triggered. After that, I turn my attention to the bait. Using a deer carcass I'd found, I place it carefully in the heart of the trap. The stench of blood and raw meat fills the air, a scent that I hope will draw the creature in. Once the trap is set, I move to the blind. I store my equipment, the binoculars, night vision goggles, tranquilizer gun, and a few other essentials. I also have a small cooler with food and water, knowing that the wait could be long. A roll of medical supplies and a first aid manual are tucked into the corner. Lastly, I take a moment to make sure my radio is working. To me, it to the park ranger's emergency channel. If anything goes wrong, if I need immediate help, this will be my lifeline. With everything in place, I settle into the blind. I position myself so that I have a clear view of the trap zone, my tranquilizer gun within easy reach. I feel my heart pounding in my chest, the adrenaline coursing through my veins, making every sense sharper, every sound clearer. As night falls, I tighten my grip on the gun and my eyes strain in gathering darkness. The forest comes alive with the sounds of nocturnal creatures, but I am waiting for one in particular. The hours tick by in a nerve wracking silence, punctuated only by the occasional hoot of an owl or rustle of wind through the trees. The waiting is a psychological battle of its own, but just as my patience is on the brink of exhaustion, a shadow detaches itself from the surrounding darkness. It's far off, barely discernible, but unmistakably there. My breath hitches as the creature makes its entrance. Even in the dim moonlight, its hulking figure is imposing, its movements incredibly graceful for a creature of such size. I watch it with bated breath and my grip tightens on the binoculars. Its eyes glow with an eerie light as it sniffs the air, an unsettling intelligence in its gaze that chills me to my core. It moves slowly and cautiously, its massive claws leaving deep gouges in the forest floor. As it gets closer, I can make out its fur dark and shaggy, gleaming under the soft moonlight. Its massive silhouette is highlighted by the silvery rays, a formidable figure of raw, unrestrained power. I can see the rise and fall of its massive chest, the twitch of its ears as it senses the environment, and the muscles rippling beneath its fur with each step it takes. With the creature's every move, my heart pounds harder. The creature is nearing the trap now that the deer carcass lays innocently in its path. Its glowing eyes fixate on the carcass, and a low growl reverberates through the quiet night. It hesitates at the edge of the clearing, head swinging from side to side as it surveys its surroundings. I hold my breath, praying that it doesn't detect the trap. After what seems like an eternity, it steps forward, drawn in by the scent of the carcass. It inches closer. A sharp intake of breath is all I manage when the creature steps onto the pile of leaves concealing the net. I watch as the tripwire tightens and releases. The ground beneath the creature erupts, and the net springs upwards. The snare has been sprung. With an earth-shaking roar, the creature thrashes against its sudden confinement. The logs I've suspended tumble down, adding their substantial weight onto the net. Despite this, the creature fights with terrifying strength, its fury shaking the forest around us. From my hiding spot, I raise the tranquilizer gun and my hands tremble. I can't afford to miss. I take a moment, forcing myself to breathe and to steady my aim. The sight through my scope is a whirlwind of fur and steel as the creature battles against its captivity. I pull the trigger, the soft hiss of the tranquilizer dart launching is drowned by the creature's roars. I watch as the dart strikes its flesh, embedding itself into the creature's thick hide, but the creature continues to struggle, its vitality unaffected. I shoot again and again, until finally the creature's movements begin to slow. Its roars turn into whimpers, then gradually subside into an eerie silence. Breathing heavily, I emerge from my hiding spot, keeping a safe distance as I approach the subdued creature. The sight of it, 
up close and personal, is both terrifying and awe-inspiring. Its body heaves with labored breaths, its eyes, once bright and menacing, now dimmed and filled with an intelligence that makes my heart clench. As I take a closer look at the creature, I can't help but marvel at its sheer size and physicality. It's easily larger than a grizzly, its body long and muscular. The fur, coarse and thick, ranges from a deep, sable black to a silvery gray, and it shimmers under the glow of the moonlight, a truly majestic sight. Its face, now calm in its tranquilized state, is a surreal mix of the familiar and the alien. It has a broad snout akin to a bear, but its eyes are different. Even subdued, they hold an intelligence and depth that's more human than animal. Their color is a startling amber, piercing and intense. It's the creature's limbs that truly underline its abnormality. They are disproportionately long, and the enlarged, clawed paws that speak of an unsettling strength. I remind myself that this creature, as incredible as it is, has been terrorizing my park, frightening the wildlife and endangering people. I need to find out why. As I move closer, something catches my eye. Beneath the fur, on the creature's hind leg, something glimmers under the moonlight. I kneel down next to the creature, my gloved hand gently parting the thick fur to reveal the mark that caught my attention. It's a small patch of hairless skin and on it, a series of numbers and letters, it's a serial number. My mind reels at the implication. This isn't just some unknown species or a random mutation. This is a product of deliberate human manipulation. An experiment. The military presence, the secrecy, and the training exercises were all attempts to recover this creature before anyone discovered the truth. Then I hear it, the distant drone of a helicopter's blades cutting through the crisp morning air. It's a sound I've become all too familiar with these past few days, yet this time it sends a jolt of alarm through me. I snap my head toward the sound. With a growing dread, I squint into the dawn. Then I see it. An ominous silhouette hovering in the distance, the spinning rotors visible in the early light. The helicopter is still too far off to make out any specific markings, but there's no mistaking the searchlight mounted beneath its fuselage. They must have heard the commotion and they're coming to investigate. A pulse of panic surges through me, but I quickly push it down. There's nothing I can do now to change what's already happened. The creature is tranquilized. I've discovered their secret, and now it seems the puppet masters behind this entire spectacle are closing in. I turn away from the approaching helicopter, its drone growing steadily louder. My gaze falls once more on the creature, its unconscious form lit by the rising sun. There's a bitter taste in my mouth as I consider the reality of the situation. They'll take the creature, they'll cover up everything, and they'll return to their secret operations as if nothing ever happened. It's a grim thought, but as the sound of the helicopter becomes an insistent roar in my ears, it's all I can think about. I step back into the shadow of the trees, tucking myself away from the spotlight that will soon sweep the area. I slip further into the shadows of the forest, carefully navigating through the undergrowth until I'm hidden behind a thick cluster of branches. From here, I have a clear view of the clearing and the unconscious creature, but I'm well concealed from prying eyes. The sound of the helicopter becomes deafening as it hovers above the clearing, its powerful spotlight piercing through the early morning mist to illuminate the scene below. Then I see them. Figures wearing military uniforms emerge from the tree line like ghosts, their guns held at the ready. They approach the tranquilized creature cautiously, their movements precise, their expressions a mix of relief and awe. I can see their faces clearly from my hiding spot. These are not the faces of men and women embarking on a routine mission. There's a gravity to their expressions, a kind of fear that can only come from the unknown. Then, as if on cue, more personnel emerge from the trees, carrying a large, thickly padded mat. They unroll it next to the creature, and after a few commands shouted over the roar of the helicopter, they begin to hoist the creature onto the mat. It's a difficult process. The creature's immense size and weight make the task difficult even for the team of soldiers. As I watch, an uncomfortable sensation takes hold of me. I feel a lump in my throat as they finally manage to get the creature onto the mat, fastening it securely with heavy-duty straps. Just as quickly as they arrived, the soldiers start to retreat, leaving behind only a small group to guard the creature. The mat, with the creature secured on it, is left in the spotlight's beam. The helicopter begins to lower, a large winch descending from its belly. I realize they're preparing to airlift the creature out of the park. 
As the helicopter's winch hooks onto the mat, I take one last look at the creature, its form illuminated in the harsh light. As the helicopter lifts higher into the air, the massive form of the creature dangling below it, I remain in my hiding spot unseen. I watch until the monstrous form becomes nothing more than a speck against a slowly brightening sky, and the echoing hum of the helicopter blades fades into silence. Then, and only then, do I dare to emerge. Yosemite feels eerily quiet. The morning chorus of birds is subdued, the air heavy with an unspoken tension. I look around the clearing at the deep grooves in the earth where the creature had been at the battered trees surrounding the area. It's a brutal reminder of the night's events. The clearing is empty, the soldiers and their machinery is now gone, leaving behind a forest marred by their actions. I can't help but run a hand over the rough arc of a tree, feeling the indentations left behind by the monstrous creature. In the distance, dawn starts to break, painting the sky with streaks of pink and orange. Feeling drained and hollow, I start the long walk back to the ranger station. Each step feels heavier than the last. The sight of the creature, the serial number etched into its skin, the military's swift retrieval, all puzzle pieces of a much larger, much more complicated picture. I look up at the expanse of sky, the new day bright and clear. The forest around me is coming alive, the creatures of Yosemite starting their day, oblivious to the drama of the night before. Life goes on, as it always does. The tranquility of the park remains, but beneath it, I now know there's a darker truth. A truth that I'm not sure what to do with, but one I can't forget. And so I keep walking forward into this new reality carrying the weight of what I've learned. As the sun fully emerges over the horizon, lighting up the landscape in hues of gold and green, I feel a small spark of determination ignite within me. The road ahead may be uncertain, but I'm ready, ready to face whatever comes next. <laughs>